Golden State Media Concepts Sci-Fi Podcast. Together we dive into the world of sci-fi and science fiction. From episodes of Star Trek, Star Wars, to The Walking Dead, Resident Evil, all the hot new science fiction movies from the back doors of Marvel or DC. The Golden State Media Concepts Sci-Fi Podcast. You'll never look at science fiction the same way again. GSMC Sci-Fi Podcast, brought to you by the GSMC Podcast Network. I'm your host, Alex. Today, I want to talk to you guys about the magicians. I am super sad that they announced this week that the magicians is ending with season five. So it's already March, and they just announced that the episodes in April will be the very last ones. So they said that they're pretty happy about it because they were able to write the season finale of this season as also being a series finale, but at the same time, they're sad that the show will not be continuing. Personally, I don't really mind Quentin not being here anymore. I thought that the season four finale was very poignant and watching him wrestle at the end with Penny verbally about whether Quentin finally found a way to commit suicide or whether he truly saved his friends. I thought that that was very beautiful. And a lot of times when you're watching a show and a character experiences suicidality, you don't get all of it. You get a chunk of it and you see what's happening with them and then they just die and that's the end. So I really enjoyed the scene of Quentin getting to experience his own funeral. I thought that was absolutely beautiful and a great way to really end his legacy at that point. Also, since we've never seen the bottom part of the underworld, it didn't necessarily mean he had to be gone forever, although I understand that the actor as well as the producers had gotten together and decided how they wanted to end that and agreed on that. So I totally respect it too. Actors are people too, and you get to a certain point and you are like, okay, my character has gone through everything he needs to go through. We are good now. So in that regard, I really enjoy Quentin as a character, but I also think that the show could have continued on without him. I've really enjoyed the season quite a bit, to be honest. And that started with season five, episode one. The end of season four was very sad, but I really enjoyed seeing where the characters are going with this. I like that Quentin didn't just have plot armor because he was one of the primary characters that we followed throughout the stories. Quentin was the closest with Fillory, with his knowledge and his love for it. And I also love that we got to see the decline of that as he really got to know Christopher Plover better. And we got to see a lot of the terrible things that happen in real life. The magicians could be really dark at some points, but it can also remind us that amidst all the crap, there are still some great things worth holding on to. And I enjoyed getting to sit in grief with these characters, as well as try to work through the messier parts of life. If you guys haven't seen the show, it is super fantastic, and I really recommend you check it out. Even though it's wrapping up with season five, five seasons is a good run for a show. We've just been kind of spoiled with shows like Doctor Who and Star Trek and Supernatural over the years that seem to run on endlessly. But really, five seasons is great. A lot of shows used to just aim for that 100 episode mark, and then they would be super stoked about it. Back when shows had like 20 episodes per season. Sometimes more. So I think that it's had a really great run, and I'm super happy to see where The Magicians goes here in the future. 
with the books. So the books are based on, or sorry, the books are by Love Grossman, and it's what the show was based on. So I think that that is a really nice place to turn to if you're very sad about the TV show ending like I am, but I think that we have fan fiction and we have other books and stuff, and we still have a few more episodes to look forward to. So the end of season four, super dark, the beginning of season five, it's done a really good job in introducing a bunch of different plot threads for us to follow. They have done a really good job making it flow well with the end of the last season and transitioning that in. So a lot of the characters are having trouble grieving still, which I love because a lot of shows, they do one episode about grief and then everybody just moves on and maybe they mention it once or twice down the line in different seasons. But in this one, we really get to dig deep into how the different characters are affected. Julia is having a hard time with trying to figure out how to honor Q. Elliot is having a similar hard time, but also figuring out what to do with the monster that had been inside of him. And also Alice is having a deal with losing Q again. Things are going crazy. There are all of these magical surges causing spells to either not work or they work way too well and things go horribly wrong or they don't work well enough or they just don't work the way that they're supposed to. So there's a lot going on here. At the end of season four, we also saw that Julia was able to use some magic again. That, you know, magic comes from pain is what we really got from the end of season four. And Julia's in a lot of pain with losing her best friend. So she's able to use this magic now. And it's amazing to watch her determination grow as she goes through this journey of mourning her best friend. Everyone's mourning in a different way. And I think it's really beautiful to see that. We're going to go on a quick break, and when we come back, we're going to talk some more about episode one of the season. Stay tuned. Want to find out what movies to go see? Then check out the GSMC Movie Podcast. It's your ticket to the latest movies, whether it's a new blockbuster event, romantic, comedy, or action flick. This show has got it all covered. They talk some what to go see now. Don't bother. What's hot on Netflix and everything in between? That's gsmcpodcast.com backslash movie dash podcast. When it's all about the movies, it has to be this new show. Don't forget to like them on Facebook and follow them on Twitter. Visit gsmcpodcast.com for more info. season four of the magicians and how the show is ending with five total seasons here in april of this year but we're also talking a little bit about how the season has started out for season five it's been a pretty wild ride so far it starts off super crazy with these magical surges and that tends to continue throughout the rest of the season it's one of the major plot lines so as Julia is working on honoring Q, she gets very excited when a ham shows up and his name is Sir Effing Ham and is a pig-like creature who's there to give a quest. So I think it's funny they picked a pig because he's a chauvinist pig at this point and he won't let Julia help even though she used to be a goddess and everything specifically because she is a woman. So that's really hilarious in this context, and it's just hanging a lantern on the fact that a lot of times people are really focusing on white male protagonists. And indeed, before Q left, Q probably would have been the one who received this guy 
He was coming to give him a quest. Indeed, the guy is looking for Q when he comes across Julia and is like, hey, can you help me find Q? And she's like, yeah, about that. I'm glad to do that for you, though. And he's like, oh, no, I need a, a white dude for it. So she's like, are you serious right now? And it's very funny. I love how this show hangs lanterns on all of those different issues in well, they really, it's not hanging a lantern per se, but it's shining a spotlight on it because they don't necessarily do a lot of the, the same trope problems that other shows do without hanging a lantern on it. But they're just shining a spotlight on those trope issues in general. And it always cracks me up and I enjoy it. So when this happens, Elliot is not really dealing with his grief at all. So Margo's a little bit mad at him about that because he is just absolutely not dealing. And Margo's like, you know, I love you, Elliot. Like, you're my best friend. Just talk to me about it. And I think that Elliot and Margo's relationship is very complex. Like, it's more than just best friends. These two are like soulmates. And I don't mean that in like the spiritual type way or like the the romantic love type way per se but just that their souls are very close and everything that they have is just so much more than best friends or you know sexual partners as they have sometimes been in the past they are two halves of the same whole and i really enjoy seeing how their relationship undergoes some stress this season as Margot just is kind of stepping more into her own compassion and kindness and Elliot is just avoiding things more and more and we really just want to see Elliot deal with it he had a monster riding passenger on him or rather turning him into a passenger in his own vehicle he kind of got carjacked by a monster except it took over his body and went ahead and killed tons and tons of people He did some really dark stuff, and he's like, oh, no, I just, I don't remember it. I don't remember what happened. I don't want to talk about it. I don't want to deal with losing Q. So he's just drowning his sorrows in booze and all kinds of other drugs. But we are also seeing, like, part of the old Elliot. He used to drink all the time at break bills, and this time he's just super sad and depressed So Margo's upset with him. He's generally upset, but also they're trying to focus on fixing the Valorian timeline because remember, they are about 300 years in the future at the end of season four, beginning of season five. They have made their way back to Fillory, but something has gone all timey-wimey and we have a big problem. Now, they are also deciding they should not be going to or from Earth until they figure out what's going on in Fillory with time, particularly because time runs differently in Fillory versus Earth. They don't know what exactly they would go back to. They don't know what other problems and variables they could introduce by doing so. So I think this is a very smart decision on their part, and I very much enjoy where they are going with this. Now, we see that uh, at this point, Josh and Finn are apparently dead because it has been 300 years, and that's a big bummer. We love those characters, but I'm excited to see where they take it with the next few episodes. In this regard, they are all really trying to figure out who the Dark King is, who now is on Fillory's throne, and his name in and of itself sounds quite foreboding. So, there's a lot of mystery going on this season, and I like how it starts out in that way, even as everyone is processing their grief, because grief doesn't really wait for anyone. It's going to keep marching on, just like time, no matter what gets thrown at you, and it has no respect, and neither does time. Neither of them, grief, time, your circumstances... They don't care what's going on with the others. Sometimes when it rains, it pours. And that's really what we're seeing happen for these characters. I really enjoyed seeing how they crumble and build themselves and each other up as these different events overwhelm them all in different ways. 
It's a lot of different issues, and it's a lot of character growth, which makes me very excited for season five. All right, we're going to go on a quick break, and when we come back, we're going to talk about how Julia and Margot's quests are going. Tired of searching the vast jungle of podcasts? Now listen close and hear this out. There's a podcast network that covers just about everything that you've been searching. The Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network is here. Nothing less than a podcast bliss with endless hours of podcast coverage. From news, sports, music, fashion, cooking, entertainment, fantasy, football, and so much more. So stop lurking around and go straight out to the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. Guaranteed to fill that podcast itch. Whatever it may be, visit us at www.gsmcpodcast.com. Follow us on Facebook and Twitter and download us on iTunes, SoundCloud, and Google Play. talking about this first episode of The Magicians and how things are going in the tiny wiminess with Fillory. But now we're going to talk about Julia and Margot's quest. So Julia is kind of trying to figure out this quest of saving the world that Sir Effingham delivered in trying to get her to give it to Q. And he refused to give her the quest, but she knows a little bit about it. And how it's some end of the world stuff. And then Margot is trying to figure out what's going on in the timey wiminess. Elliot is along for the ride, but he is mostly just blitzed out of his mind with substances while he is trying to drown his grief and his trauma regarding Quentin's death as well as having the monster carjack him for almost an entire season. So in that way, they are on the separate quest, and Penny is now a professor. He's a professor at break bills, which is kind of funny, and I love that they tried doing this with him. He's a reluctant professor, and Penny is just like, I don't want to be here. But the Dean Fogg is like, no, we need you here. Now there's nobody who else here who can teach Travelers, you are a traveler. You graduated from the school. Sufficient. So you're going to come and teach now. And Dean Fogg tricks him into signing um, some paperwork that essentially contractually obligates Penny to stay there um, upon penalty of some terrible things happening if he tries to back out. Katie has now really come to step into her own as a leader and is being a hedge witch advocate. So she's trying to get those marks removed from everyone that the library and them had utilized in order to prevent them from doing any type of magic. So a lot of these folks are essentially castrated against their will. And this is something that has been done throughout history and around the globe for centuries. So it's just essentially a type of forced sterilization in a way or an ethnic cleansing in the way that the hedges are not able to perform magic and that they are being told that, oh yeah, we'll restore your ability to do so, but they're not really taking any steps to do that for them. So Katie essentially starts a civil rights type of revolution and is trying to take back their ability to perform magic through essentially any means possible. She wants to know how to give these people this back. And since Katie was kicked out of Breakville's and was taken in by Hedges, this really means a lot to her. And I love watching her step into who she has always been and really be the best Katie that she can be. Now, is Katie still a total grump? Yes. Is Katie still struggling with her addiction? Yes. And I think it's important to recognize that 
all of those things can be true at the same time. We all have different struggles, and Katie is very much struggling at this point, but she's also doing great things. No one is perfect, and she is doing the best she can in trying to find a solution for her people. I think it's wonderful. Alice is super depressed at this point. We find that she's staying in her parents' house with her mom, who is still being super manipulative and rude to her at every turn. She's nagging Alice. She's just giving her a really hard time. But we also see her mom, Stephanie, give her some good advice, sort of, in Stephanie's own way. It's well-intentioned advice, where she tells Alice she needs to do whatever she needs to do to get through this. And for Stephanie, that is some good advice because she's saying, hey, everybody deals with grief in different ways, but I can tell you're grieving and you need to get through it, but you are going to need to do whatever you need to do to get through it. Make it your own, essentially. Now, it's not that uh, well-intentioned, per se, from Stephanie. She's just like, I kind of doesn't want to see Alice sad and bumming around anymore, but... I think that in a way, in her own way, Stephanie kind of cares for her daughter and is trying to get her out of bed. She's not a great mom by any stretch of the imagination, but this is Stephanie trying. And so we are kind of seeing that relationship develop a little more in the absence of Alice's father. So this family's been through a lot. They've lost her dad. They have lost her brother. Alice's brother, that is. And there's just a lot going on. Stephanie was already a pill before, and she is staying true to those colors at this point. So there is that going on. I feel pretty bad for Alice. And in the meantime, the library keeps sending her crazy amounts of letters to try to get her to come and work for them. And she's told them no and just ignored the rest of them. But the requests keep coming in. Now, I really enjoy where this is going, how the characters are all separate and dealing with their own grief kind of separately in this aspect. Margot wasn't that close to Q, neither was Katie, so they don't delve into it that much. And I like that, but I also like that Margot recognizes how important Q was to Elliot, and she cares about Q's death because of how much she cares about Elliot. And she's like, I want you to talk to me about it. Margot isn't trying to get Elliot to talk about Q so that Margot can achieve catharsis. She's wanting to talk about it just because she does not like seeing Elliot in pain. And I really love that perspective as well. So we have Penny at Break Bills and Margot and Elliot are in fillery. Alice is bumming around at home, super depressed, which is totally legitimate because she just watched her boyfriend die in front of her. And probably doesn't want to see Penny right now since Penny pulled her away as Q disappeared. And then we also have Katie doing hedge advocacy, but on Earth. So everyone else is on Earth except for Elliot and Margot right now. Now, Penny is not really enjoying being a professor. He's like, I don't want to be here. And he is very jaded and embittered about what's going on. So we're going to go on a quick break. And when we come back, we're going to talk about Penny. Watching TV has changed over time. Streaming has become the new norm. That's why Golden State Media Concepts Television Podcast dives headfirst to the world of cord cutting. Want to be on the loop of what's hot in Netflix? Or if it's not a preference, what about original shows in Hulu? We've got you covered. Join us as we fill in the blank and talk about movies to stream and what show you should be binging. This is the Golden State Media Concepts Television Podcast. Before the break, we were talking about 
how everyone was distributed, and where our characters each start out in separate places in Season 5. Now, we especially were talking about Penny at this point. Penny is a new break bills professor. He is a traveler and is teaching the other traveler kids because they don't know of any other travelers in this timeline who are break bills educated and can teach these kids. So he gets essentially blackmailed and signs paperwork that makes him contractually obligated to teach these kids and then starts his job. Dean Fogg is now sober, so that's new for him and an exciting component of his personal plotline. Penny initially walks into the classroom and tells everyone that they should just go ahead and leave if they want to protect themselves because traveling is super dangerous and you could end up in a wall or in the middle of a lava crater or the bottom of the ocean. You could end up just about anywhere if you are not very cognizant of what is going on and everything else that goes into being a traveler. And a lot of traveler students do die because they decide they want to just try it on their own. So Penny really does not want these kids' blood on his hands, and he is especially still reeling from Quentin's death and how he has had to pull Alice from that room. So in Penny's own type of almost angry stoicism. I mean, he's not stoic because he is angry. I guess reticence is a better word, where Penny does not want to talk about this with anyone. And we may not hear him talk about it in this season, but or, you know, since it's the last season ever again. But Penny is, I think, in that way, it's showing us that he's struggling with Quentin's death because he does not want anyone else's blood on his hands. And he was complicit in pulling Alice out of the room and letting Quentin do that little bit of mending in there that would cause the room to explode and Quentin to fully die. Also, remember that this Penny is Penny 23, not Penny 40. Everyone else in this universe that we're seeing right now is from the 40th timeline that worked out in The Magicians. So Penny 23 is from an alternate timeline where everyone else already died once. So he has had to watch Quentin die twice and he is having to deal with Alice's grief and probably also being afraid she's going to be angry at him again. So Quentin didn't die the same way in Penny 23's universe, but still, it's a lot. This Penny has seen a lot of death and suffering And this is a lot to ask of him when Dean Fogg is like, hey, come teach these students. And he is not ready. However, after a little bit, he decides that he is going to follow through with this, partly because of the terrible contract that Dean Fogg made him sign, because Penny did not read the contract first. Kids, always read the contracts before you sign them doesn't matter if it's a lease or whatever. It is very important to know your rights and responsibilities. Penny did not read this contract, and so it has borked him over. So I think it's good for Penny's character development, though. And I think that Dean Fogg really saw where this was going for Penny in general. I think he kind of recognized in his sobriety that Penny needed something just as much as Dean Fogg needed it. Dean Fogg often does things for multiple reasons and has recognized that Penny needs this outlet. So Penny is assigned this assignment with these kids, this professorship, and he kind of starts showing the kids some cool stuff too. He's like, it can be scary, but it can also be really cool and rewarding. And then one of his students says they've been hearing a signal. And he's like, you're hearing like voices? Because that used to happen to me with the beast. And they're like, no, it's more of a signal. And Penny has up a bunch of mental wards, which he also recommends to the students. But he goes ahead and lowers his wards so that he can hear the signal. And he hears it, and it's super overwhelming for him. It's very upsetting, and it kind of spazzes him out and makes him disappear. He loses all control over his traveling, which is something he had cautioned the kids against earlier. So we have been told 
again in this episode that it can be really dangerous to travel without, you know, fully intentionally trying to go a specific place. And we see this happening with Penny right now. So we well understand the gravity of this situation. Right now, we are also looking with Katie for the missing depository that she needs to find in order to obtain the knowledge she needs to remove these marks from the hedge witches and get us back to them being able to use magic. Katie is trying to remove the oppressive forces of the library from the hedge witches' lives, and Alice is also looking for a stolen book. So both of their plot lines are really library related and we're not too unfamiliar with Alice and her associations with the library, but this is going to be a little bit different for Katie. These are both kind of connected and Katie also had a pretty separate storyline in season four. So they've done a really good job in developing Katie 40 with her hedge witch relationships at this point and her history to show what's going on. Now, the protective marks and the serpent happening are still occurring right now, and I like that. I don't think that it's something that we just didn't finish dealing with in Season 4. I think it's a really great consequence of what was happening in Season 4. And I like that in The Magicians, not all threads are tied up at the same time. So we tied up a bunch of season four threads at the end of season four, but I like that we still have this one with Katie going forward because life isn't super neat like that where you can tie it all up in a bow. It is messy and we are really seeing that with Katie. So she's looking for a special book that could help the hedge witches get their powers back and we might need their help for a greater conflict in the future, just like we did in season four. We're going to go on a quick break, and when we come back, we're going to talk a little bit more about the rest of the library. Stay tuned. The GSMC Life and Happiness Podcast takes you on a journey of exploration. We'll discuss tried and true methods alongside the latest trends of how to best live your life to its fullest and happiest. From psychology to meditation, science to self-help books, the GSMC Life and Happiness Podcast will help you to discover what makes you happy and how you can live life being the best you possible. Download the GSMC Life and Happiness Podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, Google Play, or anywhere where you find podcasts just type gsmc in the search bar welcome back before the break We were talking about Katie's storyline as well as Penny's. Now we're going to talk a little bit about what happened at the end of season four and where we're going with that with the library's plotline. So at the end of season four, remember Everett, who was running the library, had decided he was going to become a god. And he was going to be a better god than all the other gods. And spoken like a true megalomaniac, he really thought he was not going to make the same mistakes they did, even with his irrational thirst for power that was quite insatiable. And the lengths he was willing to go to in order to have it all to himself. So we knew this was going to go poorly if we allowed Everett to win. And so Quentin did what he had to do at the end of season four. And... Everett also did not remove the marks like he promised he was going to. And that is, you know, partly about his death. We don't know. Uh, it could just be the library never intended to do it. Or maybe Everett really thought he would be able to control this unlimited power, as uh, Sheev Palpatine would say. So, that's where we are now, regardless of the reasoning He did not remove the marks. The library still not removed the marks. And the order of the library is in total disarray at this point. Phyllis is 
still in this season, and I love her. I love Jewel State and absolutely everything that she has been in, and this is no different. She is reaching out to Alice like tons of other librarians within the Order to obtain her help. So a lot of folks have been sending Alice these letters, and they're not just going, hey, come help the library. They're specific things. They need Alice's help in a ton of different ways. But Alice has told everyone else no, but decides to come in to accept Phyllis's request to fix a blank branch index that had been used under the old regime. So Alice is like, you know what, okay. But, you know, just like Alice, Alice never does anything without a reason, especially ever since she became a Niffin and then returned to being human. Alice has been quite different and is doing some pretty crazy stuff. Alice is making some dark decisions as time goes by, and we can see her beginning to follow Stephanie's advice of doing whatever she needs to do in order to mourn Q and move forward. So we're like, okay, cool. Alice is at least out of bed at this point and out walking around the world. But really, given Alice's proclivity for chaos and shenanigans in the past, as well as bad decisions, is this really a good thing? I don't know. We're going to find out. But the Netherlands are really messed up right now as well. So Alice goes in and, under the guise of doing some stuff for Phyllis, goes ahead and steals a book. So she does go ahead and translate part of the book, I believe, but then she definitely steals the one that she needs and leaves while Phyllis has gone to pee from drinking too much. So at this point, we have Alice stealing a book, and we see her going to get a golem. She's going to make a golem. So we've seen an Elliot golem in previous seasons, and now we know where the living clay that went missing at Breakville's is. So Alice has gone to get the living clay you use to make golems out of people and is getting them. So we've seen a Margot golem and we've also seen an Elliot golem in the past. And the golems don't always tend to have the full personality, but sometimes they can. So in this case, she is ready to do something crazy like Stephanie recommended to help her complete her grief process. And we can all kind of guess where Alice is going with this. Alice is not really good at letting sleeping dogs lie or letting dead anyone lie. She just does a lot of crazy, crazy things until she gets exactly what Alice thinks is best. Because above all else, Alice is like a Hermione and she really thinks she knows better than everyone else. And sometimes Alice does make the hard choices that are technically better for everyone else, but also sometimes she makes just very selfish choices. So we're going to see how this one turns out. I'm leaning towards she's going to do something incredibly selfish, because that just seems like the bad news bears idea we are going down with this plot line, especially since she's following Stephanie's advice, which is generally never good. So at this point, we have not seen a couple of characters. So we've been talking about the library and we've seen the library. But typically when we see the library, we see Zelda. So where is she at this point? We know that Phyllis is still there at least. So that's really nice. But Josh and Finn are ostensibly dead in the past, like 300 years back. And we have a predicted apocalypse from Sir Effingham. So Julia just knows that there is an apocalypse and she is ready to fight this apocalypse here on Earth. She's, you know, not, essentially she's not freaking out at this point. This gives Julia a sense of purpose, which Julia desperately needs. Whenever something traumatic happens to Julia, she doubles down. Whether that is like when she removed her shade or when she is now at this point going ahead and making some questionable decisions about where to take things next and how to save the world. That's okay. 
Julia thinks outside of the box. And as Quentin had said at one point, Julia not getting into break bills is like Hermione not getting into Hogwarts. So we kind of view Alice as Hermione in a lot of ways because she is, you know, kind of a goody two shoes and she's super knowledgeable. But even though Julia is a lot darker in mannerisms and in experience at this point, and in her expression of it more so, she is also still very, very intelligent and very gifted with magic. So I'm excited to see where they take Julia's plotline in this story as well as the season continues. I'm really excited for the timey wiminess. A lot of times we see timey wimey stuff in more sci fi, but The Magicians is more magical realism, of course, under the umbrella of speculative fiction. It is fantasy as well, but I am stoked to see what they do with this. It's really exciting for me, and I like this storyline with the library and these characters really coming into their own and having some more of their own missions as they wade through their grief. It's a really great storytelling in the series. Sarah Gamble has always been known for fantastic storytelling, so I'm not surprised at all that they're still able to carry this through without Q, and I've really loved it. A lot of the folks in some of the Facebook (laughs) groups that I'm in for the magicians are not so keen on Q not being here, and you know, that may be part of why we're not going to get any more seasons. So, you know, in Stargate SG-1, the Daniel Jackson disappeared for a while, and then we got him back after a whole season without him, just because of contract negotiations and stuff. Now, I'm not at all saying that that's what happened with the magicians. The actor and, who played Q, as well as the producers and stuff, have talked about it and all said it was a mutual decision and all that. But what I am saying is that sometimes if you're patient and you keep up the viewership and you wait long enough, then characters can be reintroduced, even as just small one-offs. We got to see Jack O'Neill a lot, even after season eight of Stargate. He guest starred on Universe, as well as Stargate Atlantis. So if we had maybe stayed the course a little bit more, I think we would have been more okay. But as it is... It is what it is. So we are going to be a little bummed when The Magician's ends, but we can also still talk about it quite a lot. That's one of the beauties of art and also of streaming services. All right, we're going to go on a quick break, and when we come back, we're going to talk about the Dust movie, CC. The Golden State Media Concepts Travel Podcast, the show that gives you advice on everything travel. We explore places you've always wanted to go, as well as giving tips for traveling in those places. We'll give you advice on the best sites for travel tips, information, and discounts. Join us as we travel the world, explore cultures, and meet new people. The Golden State Media Concepts Travel Podcast has got you covered. Download the GSMC Travel Podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, Google Play, or anywhere you find podcasts. Just type GSMC in the search bar. back before the break we were talking about season five episode one of the magicians and wrapping up where everyone is at the end of episode one now we're going to talk a little bit about cc it is a short film from dust so if you guys are familiar with dust or the facebook page the dust portal they release sci-fi entertainment films a lot of them are really short but they're a brand really and some of them have some really great actors and actresses in them who have been in other sci-fi shows and films that we've seen over the years so in this case cc stars jewel state as an ai nanny and i really enjoyed this one 
I also was really excited to pick this one for this episode because Jules State also plays Phyllis in The Magicians. So in this case, Cece is an AI nanny who is looking after a little girl who is the most important thing to her in her entire life. So she's programmed to do absolutely whatever the little girl needs and to always put the little girl's needs first. So over time, we get to see just throughout the day what Cece's day with this little girl looks like, what her evening bedtime routine with the kid looks like. And it's adorable. The kid clearly loves her with all of her heart. But we get the kid into bed and then we go ahead and we see the mom come home. So the mom comes home clearly completely drunk and Cece's like, Lena, please make sure that you keep it down. Your daughter's in bed. And she's like, well, I wanted to go ahead and, you know, tell her good night and everything. So I'm going to go do that right now. And Cece steps between the mom and the stairs and is like, no, she needs her rest. She's already in bed and it's past her bedtime. So you need to just let her sleep and you can see her tomorrow. Lena is clearly drunk and distressed. So she's not really handling this well. She's being kind of belligerent. And Cece seems to really care, though, about what's going on with Lena. So she's chopping up some carrots and stuff for the little girl's food in the morning or for the next day at school. And when she's doing this, she's asking Lena, hey, you know, what's wrong? And Lena says that she's upset because she's worried about money and everything because she lost her job that day to another artificial life form who can do it quicker and better and just overall cheaper as well. So it's also a story about how people are worried about AI taking their jobs as well as how AIs can kind of go wrong due to their programming of making them always put people first. So I really like how they have addressed this and they're like, oh yeah, this is a programming issue. But as things continue, we see that Lena is really upset about losing the job to an artificial life form and is really kind of taking it out on Cece at this point. She's bitter and she's drunk and just upset about losing her job. So she's like, okay, fine, if I can't go and kiss my daughter goodnight, can you at least show me the footage of what her day looked like? So Cece activates it from her Android body and, you know, puts it on an iPad-looking device that Lena can watch as, like, a chopped-up series of slides from throughout the day. But it's video. So it's like you know, a little two-minute synopsis of the highlights of the day. So, you know, the little girl has drawn a picture of her and an adult woman and is like, hey, Cece, that's me and you. And you just see Cece having a really great time with the kid and the kid loving her so much and sharing these really kind of maternal moments together. And you can see the resentment building in Lena right now, even though She should be really happy that Cece's taking such good care of her kid. She's just distressed. And when people are hurt, they lash out. So Lena is lashing out at Cece at this point. It's really intense and she gets mad and she sees the picture on the fridge of Cece with her daughter and is even more upset and she opens up the fridge and sees that there is a container of juice in there that's like the organic expensive brand is like what are you doing buying this juice and she's like Cece's like that's the best kind that's the one that's the best for your daughter so that's what I get she gets the best of everything and she's like well get her the cheaper one she goes but that wouldn't be the best for her Lena so she comes first and just keeps you know chopping these carrots Lena comes over and is like, you know, I'm going to prepare my daughter's lunch for tomorrow. And Cece's like, no, I'm, I'm more, I'm quicker at it than you are. And I'll, I'll, I already know how she likes it and I'll, I'll get it done ASAP. And Lena tries to take the knife and Cece's like, I've got it. Look, I'm already done. And we look down, we see these little heart shaped carrots 
And it shows us that, you know, Cece is really above and beyond as a caretaker and is kind of the mom that Lena wishes she was. And she feels super inferior to Cece. So she's not only feeling upset towards artificial intelligence for her job and feeling outperformed as a professional, but also as a mother, which is really cutting. I very much enjoy that this episode is just mostly women and about these interpersonal relationships and caretaking. There's not a husband in the picture that we need to worry about coming home and starting an affair with the aide. This is very much a female lens type situation. And it is by twin sisters, Sam and Kaylee Spear. They wrote and directed this sci-fi thriller. So I really enjoy the different perspective. There's not any sexualization in here at all. And, you know, I think sexualization definitely has its place. Don't get me wrong. I'm going to watch, you know, Species as well. But I really like this because it comes across as quite different in a way. Finally, though, this movie gets to the point where Lena and Cece face off and Lena's, like, calling on her phone and going, hey, how do you shut down my you know, my nanny aid, my artificially intelligent device. And they're like, well, we need her um, serial number. And so Cece's going, don't do this. I'm the best thing for your daughter. You are not going to be able to take care of her like I can and all this other stuff. And it's kind of like going all single white female on her and uh, being exceptionally crazy and is about to try to take over her role as mother. And at that point... Uh, Lena starts trying to read the serial number off of her phone really quickly, and we look down and see that Cece has stabbed her in the stomach with a knife, just a kitchen knife. And then the little girl comes down the stairs and yells for Cece, which is, you know, just pouring salt into that wound that the mom has literally in her stomach right now. And Cece takes the little girl and is like, we have to go right now. Let's, let's go ahead and go. And so... They go out into the night and eventually they find an investigative team to, to, you know, get Cece and the little girl and retrieve them, make sure the daughter is safe and start looking into what's going on. So the investigative team who are cops are able to get a hold of them. And then we see people who run the nanny aid program determining what went wrong with this aid that she stabbed another person. And they realize nothing went wrong, really. There's nothing wrong with the bot. She did not go ahead and just freak out and glitch or anything. It's not a glitch. It's just part of her programming because she's programmed to always put the child's needs first. So in this case, that's kind of backfired. And they're like, okay, well, it's a programming error. We're going to have to reprogram a lot of the others. Let's go ahead and take care of this. And they're like, cool, go ahead and wipe her. And so we see Cece in the other room start freaking out. She's like, no, you told me I could see the little girl. If I cooperated and showed you what happened and everything, please let me see her. I love her so much. Please let me see her. And we also know that the little girl is asking for Cece. And it's just kind of heartbreaking as she's looking through this two-way glass, two-way mirror, trying to, you know, convince them to not shut her down. But they go ahead and wipe her and remove the little girl from being in her memory banks at all. And then we see the little girl go into the hospital room where her mom is with a caretaker, and she's looking for Cece. And the mom's like, oh, honey, I'm going to be okay. And that's clearly not what the kid was focused on. But this is her new reality at this point. So this child's mom has not only been stabbed, but she barely knows this mom. Their mom is in turmoil and not in a good emotional place. And this child has lost the only caretaker that she has truly known. And all she's going to hear about it probably is that she went crazy and stabbed her mom. So it's going to cause her a lot of, of stress in the future. But things like that happen to kids all the time. Not with AI, but also just with real people being crazy. So I really enjoyed seeing how they played out this time. And I really liked this Dust short film. If you are really into DC's Legends of Tomorrow or Altered Carbon or The Good Doctor, there are actresses from those series in this short film as well. If you're not familiar with Dust, definitely check out 
their Dust Portal page on Facebook or check out some of their short films on YouTube. They are super cool. They're free to watch and they're so much fun. They're by so many different folks and there are so many different directors and actors and actresses involved who you will definitely recognize a ton of their names. It's a lot of fun to watch and they play out in a kind of similar way to like Philip K. Dix to Android's Dream of Electric Sheep, where they're not related to each other at all, and they're in varying lengths, but are all sci-fi themed. Thank you for listening to the GSMC Sci-Fi Podcast, brought to you by the GSMC Podcast Network. I'd like to ask that you please remember to subscribe to the show, and writing a nice review always really helps us. Also, if you can please follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, I'd appreciate it. Thank you kindly, and have a good night. You've been listening to the Golden State Media Concepts Sci-Fi Podcast, part of the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. You can find this show and others like it at www.gsmcpodcast.com. Download our podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, and Google Play. Just type in GSMC to find all the shows from the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network, from movies to music from sports to entertainment and even weird news you can also follow us on twitter and on facebook thank you and we hope you have enjoyed today's program